Tonight's topic focuses on oceans, human health, and the urgent need for sustainable resource management. To introduce our speaker, we're pleased to have Barry Costa Pierce, the director of the Rhode Island Sea Grant, uh, introduce, do the introduction. So, Barry can come up. Well, good evening, everyone. Before I introduce our distinguished speaker, I'd like to say how proud we are to join the Graduate School of Oceanography and all of you in the audience in celebrating 50 years of outstanding accomplishments for the School of Oceanography. A little bit about our 40th year anniversary, which is 2011. Uh, the Rhode Island Sea Grant College Program, if, as, at 40 years, it was dedicated uh, in 1965 and honors the memory of our beloved Senator Claiborne Pell 40 years ago when the University of Rhode Island was designated as one of the first of America's four Sea Grant College programs. It's a fitting tribute tonight that we not only look backward at what Senator Claiborne Pell did for our state as the ocean state, but also making that into one of the world's most renowned networks of marine universities. The University of Rhode Island 40 years ago in its designation joined three other universities as the first four Sea Grant College programs, the University of Washington, Oregon State, and Texas A&M. Our former Dean of the Graduate School of Oceanography, John Knauss, in 1965 made this a reality and organized the first Sea Grant Conference in Newport, Rhode Island. And today we can be proud that there's a Sea Grant College program in every coastal and Great Lakes state in the country, including the Virgin Islands, Guam, Puerto Rico, and uh, Palau. So with, without, uh, with the foundation of Rhode Island Sea Grant so closely tied to the Graduate School of Oceanography, Sea Grant is very proud to share its anniversary year and to co-sponsor this lecture that looks at an issue that is as relevant today as it was in the founding of Sea Grant, that is the critical connection to humans and the ocean. Now it gives me great professional and personal pleasure to introduce to you tonight Professor Ed Laws. Professionally, Ed is held in very, very high regard by our peers in the marine science world as one of the most accomplished marine scientists of our time. A little bit of Ed's history. He graduated with a BA in chemistry and a PhD in chemical physics from Harvard University. He then was an instructor at Florida State University in their oceanography program for three years then went to the land of Aloha, the University of Hawaii, where he worked for 30 years until 2005 when he joined Louisiana State University as the Dean of the School of Coast and the Environment, where Ed is currently Chair of the University's Department of Environmental Sciences. But Ed never could really leave Hawaii. He also holds the position of the Director of the Pacific Research Center for Marine Biomedicine in Hawaii, one of the only four centers of excellence in our nation in oceans and human health, which is supported by the National Science Foundation and the National Institute for the Environmental Health Sciences. Ed is the author of a classic textbook, which many of you in the audience have known about throughout your professional career, called Aquatic Pollution which is now in its third edition and has been translated into numerous foreign languages. It has over 140 peer-reviewed scientific papers and has twice received the Best Paper of the Year Award from the Geochemical Society and the International Phycological Society. Now, personally, it's very, very special for me to have Ed here at URI. I was Ed's PhD student supported by his grant from Hawaii Sea Grant. Then Ed helped get me my first job in Hawaii as an extension agent for Hawaii Sea Grant. Thank you, Ed. <laughs> On behalf of me and your many students, we are forever grateful for your outstanding instruction and mentoring that has placed a fundamental part of our success as professionals and people. <laughs> 
The title of Ed's talk tonight is Oceans and Human Health, The Urgent Need for Sustainable Resource Management. Welcome to the University of Rhode Island, Ed. Thanks, Barry, for that um, very good introduction. And I want, just want to point out that Barry uh, was certainly one of the uh, bright points in, in my career at the University of Hawaii. He was absolutely <laughs> a delight to have as a graduate student, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed working with him. Now, the topic I'm going to be talking about this evening is a bit controversial. Uh, there's, there's a lot of relationship to climate change, and of course, on a night like this, you might wonder about the whole concept of global warming, but I think most uh, scientists who have looked at this issue carefully have concluded that it's happening and that uh, there will be very significant consequences for human beings uh, down the line. And this is certainly one of the points that I want to drive home this evening, that this is not something that's going to go away in 25 or 50 or 100 years. It's a problem that's going to be with us for thousands of years. Now, the good news is that there's a lot that we can do uh, to mitigate the consequences. We have the technological capability to do it. Uh, whether we have the political and, and social uh, motivation to go ahead, I think is uh, the big question. But certainly, we know a lot about what needs to be done to address the issues. Uh, first of all, I'm going to look forward a bit to try to provide some context to this to see where we are headed in the long term with respect to climate. And then I'm going to look back in time a bit uh, to try to get some sense of how the climate on the Earth has been changing in times past. And one of the messages I want to get across this evening is that the climate on the Earth has been changing, and not in small ways. It's been changing over a much longer time frame, however, than the present uh, changes are occurring. So both the past climate of the Earth and what, what we believe lies ahead are very informative uh, to provide some context to this issue. Well, humans first appeared on the Earth about 150,000 years ago as best we can tell. And the climate on the Earth during the last 150,000 years has been uh, quite different uh, than it has been in times past. First of all, interestingly, it has been colder. Over, over periods of hundreds of millions of years, going back in time, the climate on the Earth, as best we can tell, has been typically quite a bit warmer than it is now. Uh, as I said, the climate has been relatively constant. Now, we, we happen to be in the midst of an ice age, a so-called quaternary ice age. This is an interglacial in that ice age, but ice ages are not the norm for the Earth. So uh, the period of time during which human beings have lived on the Earth is unusual in these respects. And interestingly, as best we can tell, again, in times past, going back hundreds of millions of years, there has generally been substantially more CO2 in the atmosphere than there is now. And when I say substantially more, if you go back 400, 450 million years, you're probably looking at CO2 concentrations that are 10, 15 times what they are now. And of course, CO2 is a greenhouse gas, so that's important implications for climate. Uh, Complex organisms first appeared on the Earth uh, roughly 450,000 years, 450 million years ago. Uh, life evolved during that time and flourished, obviously under conditions that are very different than now. So it, it is very likely that the climate of the Earth is going to change in significant ways in the future uh, through perfectly natural processes. And if human beings expect to continue to survive and flourish on this planet, sooner or later we will have to adapt. Now, admittedly, uh, we're facing some issues in the near term. But if we look long term, 
it's almost inevitable that climate is going to change in significant ways. So what are the long-term regulators of climate? And I suppose in this day and age, most people would say greenhouse gases, but the, the first thing is the sun. Without the sun, obviously, the climate on the Earth would be very different. The temperature would be close to absolute zero. Now, you might take the sun for granted, but the fact is, over long periods of time, the energy output from the sun has not been constant and it's not going to be constant in the future. The solar system is about four and a half billion years old. The sun has been aging over that time, and uh, the energy output has been changing. So what do we have uh, to look forward to in the future? Well, astrophysicists tell us that the sun is a so-called main sequence star, and like other stars, it's carrying out fusion reactions. It's converting hydrogen and its core into helium. And of course, that's responsible for the energy output. But essentially, it's burning its fuel. It's converting hydrogen to helium. Uh, once it has converted a substantial percentage of the hydrogen into helium in the core, the core begins to collapse due to the force of gravity and the conversion of hydrogen to helium begins to pick up in the shell surrounding the core. And we know this from studying other main sequence stars and their behavior. Now, interestingly then, what happens is that the sun begins to expand. Gravity slowly loses the battle. And the sun becomes what is called a red giant, a very big star. So how big does the sun become? Well, I've skipped over some stuff here. If you go back to four and a half billion years ago and look at the energy output from the sun up to the present time, because the sun has been slowly expanding, the energy output from the sun incident on the Earth has probably increased by about 40%. We can imagine that has had a major impact on the climate of the Earth. And so people who study the climate of the Earth speculate about what the climate was like several billion years ago when the energy output from the sun was substantially less than it is now. The evidence indicates, interestingly, that the climate was not that different, that the temperatures were not that different. And this implies, for lack of any better reason, that the concentration of greenhouse gases must have been substantially greater in times past than is presently the case, because we were not getting anywhere near as much energy incident on the Earth several billion years ago than we are at the present time. Now, the bad news is the sun will continue to expand, and eventually, it becomes this red giant. So here, here's the sun right now, and this is a blow up. There's the size of the sun, and this is how big astrophysicists tell us the sun will eventually become. It will become about 200 times bigger than it is now. And it will literally swallow up Mercury and Venus. And there's about a 50-50 chance that it will swallow up the Earth. Now, what's the time frame for this? Well, the time frame is billions of years, but you know, as the sun expands, you can imagine the climate on the Earth is going to become very hot. And eventually, the oceans and all water on the planet will literally boil away. Life as we know it will be completely impossible in about a billion years. And so, if you're concerned about global warming on that time frame, there's a lot to be concerned about. Now, I gave this lecture and another one on climate change to a group of honor students about a year ago at Louisiana State University. And one of the students came up after the first lecture and said, Dr. Laws, I don't think anyone will come to your second lecture. This is so 
well, I don't know what adjective he used, discouraging. Uh, I'm bringing this up uh, to point out that there's a time frame issue involved here. How far in the future do we care about the climate of the Earth? I don't think you should worry about this, but if we're not going to worry about what the climate on the Earth is like in a billion years, should we be concerned about what the climate will be like in a million years, or a thousand years, or a hundred years, or whatever? And so I'm going to argue this evening that we should be concerned about the climate on the Earth for hundreds of thousands of years. There's, there's no reason that human beings should not survive that long unless the Earth is, is hit by an asteroid or something like that. Uh, and so we would hope that we can leave uh, the climate on the Earth in a condition that is compatible with human life and animal and plant life for a long time. And the point I want to make as I go through this talk is that what we're doing to the climate system is going to affect the climate on the Earth for tens of thousands of years. All right, so here we are at the current situation. Uh, if it were not for greenhouse gases, if we just had the sun as a source of warming, the average temperature on the Earth would be about minus 18 degrees Celsius, well below freezing. So although it's fair to say that the sun is the primary determinant of the climate of the Earth, without greenhouse gases, it would obviously be a lot colder than it is now. Now, of course, you hear a lot about CO2 as a greenhouse gas. But interestingly, it's not the primary greenhouse gas. In fact, it's not even close to being the primary greenhouse gas. Water vapor accounts for over half the greenhouse effect. CO2 is in second place, but it's 18% overall average. So you might wonder from that, well, if that's true, why all the concern about CO2? Why aren't we concerned about water vapor? And here's the reason. We can look at the saturation of vapor pressure of water as a function of temperature. And these are cold temperatures, minus 20 Celsius, zero, 20. Here you're getting into the tropics. You can see you go up to maybe 2 or 3%. But that's it. That's all the water vapor you can get into the atmosphere. After that point, it starts to condense out. And if you go to a place like Baton Rouge in the summer, you're looking at about 95% relative humidity. You just can't put any more water vapor into the atmosphere because it'll just rain out. So the fact is, if you look at, if you sit down and write an equation for what happens when you burn fossil fuels, what gases do you produce? You produce carbon dioxide and water vapor. The reason we're not concerned about the water vapor is that there's a very real limit to how much water vapor there can be in the atmosphere. At that point, it starts to rain out. Now, CO2 right now, by comparison, is only about 0.038%. So if you go back and look at those percentages and then realize that you're looking at water vapor several percent in the atmosphere and CO2 at only a tiny fraction of a percent, per molecule, CO2 is actually a much more potent greenhouse gas than water vapor. But there's very little of it in the atmosphere even now after all this fossil fuel burning. And that's why water vapor is the primary greenhouse gas. However, if you take into account this temperature effect, you go to high latitudes where the temperature is low, it's impossible to have high concentrations of water vapor in the atmosphere. And so CO2 becomes, by default, a much more important greenhouse gas at high latitudes where the temperatures are low because there is a lot less water vapor in the atmosphere there. Now that's going to be important as I get into issues later on in this talk. So at, at low latitudes, 
Near the equator, for example, water vapor is by far the dominant greenhouse gas, and it is overall on average. But if you go to high latitudes, CO2 takes on a lot more importance. Now, I'm going to quickly go through the history of the Earth just to point out how the climate on the Earth has been changing, and I'm going to focus particularly on the, the last eon geologic time during which there have been complex uh, life forms living on the Earth. For the, about the first 700 million years, uh, the Earth was basically a molten planet. There's no evidence that there were any rocks or continents, uh, and that's referred as to the Hadean eon. And there's nothing living on the Earth during that time. And you get into a period from about 3.8 billion years to 2.5 billion years ago, and you get your first life forms. These are not complex organisms. They're unicellular organisms, single-celled organisms. Not only that, they're prokaryotic, which means they have essentially no structure inside the cell. There's no nucleus, for example. Very primitive organisms. And interestingly, no oxygen in the atmosphere. Now, the first thing you, reaction you might have to saying there's no oxygen in the atmosphere is Obviously, you couldn't breathe, which is true. But another very important point about oxygen not being in the atmosphere is if there's no oxygen in the atmosphere, there's no ozone in the atmosphere. And ozone, as you may know, is a gas that blocks ultraviolet radiation. And without that shield against ultraviolet radiation, it is impossible for living organisms to survive on the Earth. So where did these first unicellular organisms live? They lived in the ocean. Because water is a very effective blocker of ultraviolet radiation. So during this period of, as you can see, over a billion years, Yes, there was life on the Earth, but there was no life on the continents because there was no shield against ultraviolet radiation. Then we get into the period from two and a half billion years ago up to about 544 million years ago, and that's a proterozoic. And then you have another form of life, eukaryotic organisms. These are still single-celled organisms, but they have complex cellular organization. So you and I are obviously not unicellular, but we are eukaryotic. The cells in your body have a nucleus, for example. Plants have chloroplasts and so forth. And then a very important development in the history of the Earth. Oxygen appears in the atmosphere. And the oxygen appeared because these eukaryotic organisms were photosynthetic. And the photosynthetic process produces oxygen. For a long time, that oxygen was incorporated in chemical reactions in the ocean. For example, in oxidized iron and sulfur. But eventually, the oxygen escaped into the atmosphere. Concentration of oxygen built up in the atmosphere. And at that point, it is possible for life on the continents to happen. And that is exactly what happens during the last eon of geologic time, the Phanerozoic. So right now, we are living in the so-called Phanerozoic eon of time. And there are three eras associated with the Phanerozoic, separated by major, major extinctions of life. And these extinctions are caused by climate change. The first one of the eras is the Paleozoic, from 544 million years ago to 250. And at the end of the Paleozoic, you have the biggest extinction of all time, the so-called PT extinction. And I'll go into briefly why that happened. Again, it's, it's a climate change, but you know what, what triggered the climate change? Then we have the Mesozoic which is a period of time 
uh, during which you had dinosaurs, as an example, goes up to 65 million years ago. Then you have the second largest extinction of all time, the so-called KT extinction. And you probably know this is believed to have been caused by an asteroid hitting the Earth in the vicinity of Mexico. And it's, it's not the fact that the asteroid hit the Earth, it's the dust that was injected into the atmosphere that caused the extinction, basically blocked sunlight for a long period of time because the atmosphere was filled with dust. And we live in the third of these eras, the Cenozoic, right up to the present time. Now, this is an important slide for the context of this discussion because it shows how important features of the climate have been changing during the last 550 million years, the Phanerozoic. So here you have Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic, and by the way, uh, we live, as I said, in an ice age. It's a quaternary ice age. It's right over here. It's this little sliver of time. So you can see how short the period of time is that human beings have been on this planet from a geologic standpoint. It's about, if you look at the whole history of the Earth, four and a half billion years, it's equivalent to about one second out of 24 hours. Now, the dark curve here is a reconstruction of the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. Uh, it's a model associated with a professor at Yale University, but as best we can tell, this is accurate, at least approximately so. And you can see that the CO2 concentration right now is at a low point. In fact, there's only one point here about 300 million years ago when the CO2 concentration was comparable to what it is now. And if you go back in time, 500, 550 million years, it's 15 or 20 times higher. And this is the temperature, this blue curve. And you can see that there are a few periods of time here about 450 million years ago, when the temperature was as low as it is right now. The average temperature on the Earth right now is roughly 12 or so degrees Celsius. And there are many periods of time during the time that complex life forms have been on the planet where the temperature has been about 10 degrees Celsius warmer than it is now. The only period of time that short sliver of time in the past when the CO2 concentration and the temperature have been as low as they are now is right in here between the Carboniferous and the Permian periods about 300 million years ago. So the point is that the climate on the Earth in the past has typically been very different from what it is now. And this is a whole time frame within which complex life organisms evolved and lived on this planet. So when people talk about how terrible it is that climate is going to change, the changing climate has actually been the norm. And as you've seen, it's going to get a lot hotter if you look ahead hundreds of millions of years nothing to do with CO2, a lot to do with what the sun is going to do. So things will continue to change, and human beings will have to adapt. Now, I mentioned that these two big extinctions were caused by climate change. Uh, the biggest one of all time, the so-called PT extinction, or Permian-Triassic extinction, about 250 million years ago, you can see the damage 60% of all animal species, 90% of marine species, 70% of terrestrial vertebrate families vanished. As best we can tell, obviously no one was around to witness this, the cause of this extinction was a series of volcanic eruptions that lasted about a million years in Siberia. And these are called 
the Siberian traps. I'm not going to go into why they're called traps, but that is the name, the Siberian traps. That was a massive outpouring of lava or basalt. Uh, the estimated volume is as much as 4 million cubic kilometers over that period of time. And the area in question here, it's huge. And if you go to this place, this is what it looks like. This is the basalt, obviously solidified, uh, that poured out in this part of the world for a million years. And this basalt is about 2,000 meters thick. It's over a mile thick. Now, so what? Why would that cause a mass extinction of life? Obviously, it would affect the in the immediate vicinity of where these eruptions occurred, but what about the rest of the planet? Why would a long series of volcanic eruptions cause mass extinctions? And kind of a flippant answer to that is volcanoes have bad breath. They emit CO2 big time. Volcanoes are a major source of CO2. They emit sulfur oxides which reflect sunlight and actually cool things down. And they combine with water vapor to form sulfuric acid, which is a strong acid. So you get acid rain, and you have other acids coming out uh, with the volcano. So this is a little schematic. Here's the eruptions taking place, and the gases that are coming out that could play havoc with the environment. I want to, you to follow this one here and look at what effect the CO2 emissions have. The continental weathering is just a, a manifestation, so there's geological evidence that this was going on. CO2 being a greenhouse gas and having a very long residence time in the atmosphere is going to cause long-term warming. Now, later on in this talk, I'm going to explain why the residence time is so long, and that's one of the issues that we're facing right now. Once the CO2 goes up, it's up for a long time. And so things warm up, and the surface waters of the ocean warm, and the ocean stagnates. It does not overturn vertically. <clears throat> the only way for oxygen to get into the bottom waters of the ocean is through exchange with the atmosphere, which means the water has to have been in contact with the atmosphere, sunk. And I'll show you where that happens, just a couple places where it happens. So the, the water has to be in contact with the atmosphere. It picks up oxygen from the atmosphere. It sinks, and it's down at the bottom of the ocean, typically for 500 to 1,000 years. Now, during that time, there's obviously a possibility that the oxygen will be consumed by organisms living in the water because they're respiring, they're consuming oxygen. And if the overturning of the ocean is sluggish enough, the bottom water is going oxygen. They're stripped of oxygen. And then you have mass extinctions because the animals suffocate. And there is good evidence that this has happened from time to time in the past, when the, the thermal circulation, or we call the thermohaline circulation of the ocean, slows down or literally stops, the ocean goes anoxic. Now, you may know that there are some places in the ocean right now where the bottom waters are anoxic. Most of the Black Sea is totally anoxic. It does not overturn. And you may know that there's an area off the Mississippi River that late in the summer, year after year, goes hypoxic, does not go anoxic, but the oxygen concentration is very low. And there's other places in the ocean where we see this, so this is you know, not at all unprecedented. And we think this is probably what caused the mass extinction of marine organisms. So, <clears throat> let's get to 
Most of the ocean is in the dark. The ocean is about 4,000 meters, 3,800 meters deep. The sunlight penetrates at best to about 150 meters in the clearest ocean water. So you do have photosynthesis going on in the surface waters where there's enough light to support the process. But most of the ocean is, in fact, in the dark, which means there is no mechanism producing oxygen. And so you're completely dependent on this vertical circulation to provide the bottom waters of the ocean with oxygen. And there's only a couple places where bottom waters and deep waters are formed. One is in the North Atlantic. During the winter time in the Northern Hemisphere, as the Gulf Stream transports water towards Europe, because it's winter time, it's losing heat to the atmosphere. Eventually, it becomes cold enough that it starts to sink. And the seawater there is relatively salty, so it sinks rather effectively to depths of between two and four kilometers. It typically does not sink to the bottom. And the Weddell Sea off the coast of Antarctica during the wintertime, wintertime in the southern hemisphere, you're forming sea ice. The water literally freezes. So the, the temperature of the seawater is as cold as it can possibly get. It's at the freezing point. It's about minus two Celsius. When the ice forms, the salt is, ex is ex excluded from the ice. The ice is basically fresh water. So the seawater that remains is very salty, and it's right at the freezing point. So it's as cold as it can get. It sinks all the way to the bottom. And that is the only place anywhere in the ocean that we actually form bottom water. So that is the only mechanism for putting oxygen in the bottom of the ocean. So you can understand how crucial this vertical mixing is. And if you warm the surface waters of the ocean sufficiently, you shut it down. And then the ocean goes anoxy. So you can imagine why oceanographers are concerned about global warming. Now, this is not something that's going to happen in a few years. But given time, and again, this problem is going to be with us for thousands of years. So it's possible that we may be looking at serious consequences for the ocean. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I'm sure you're all aware that uh, an asteroid landed. Uh, it hit part of Mexico, uh, part of the Gulf of Mexico. The evidence for this is a layer of iridium that is found, interestingly, all over the world. This happens to be in Colorado. But right there is the KT extinction that layer of rock. And if you analyze that, you find very high concentrations of iridium. Iridium is a very unusual element. It's not very abundant at all in the Earth. It is abundant in meteorites. And so that was the, the evidence that led to the conclusion that uh, this extinction was a result of an asteroid hitting the Earth. And here's a couple of dinosaurs that decided to take a vacation in Mexico. 65 million years ago, very bad timing. Uh, here comes the asteroid. And again, it's, of course, anything in the vicinity of this impact would have been wiped out. But the, the extinction, the, the massive extinction of life on Earth associated with this impact is due to the fact that when this thing hit, it injected into the atmosphere massive amounts of ash and dust. And it's easy enough to go through a back of the envelope calculation and figure out how much got injected into the atmosphere and, and how effective that would have been in blocking sunlight. I've done this calculation, and it totally blocks the sun. So you have an extended period of time during which, obviously, the temperature would have dropped dramatically. And of course, there would have been no sunlight to support photosynthesis.
it's not surprising that there was a massive extinction as a result of this. So now I'm going to fast forward a little bit. Uh, we go right to the current ice age. So we're in an ice age. Now you sometimes people hear people misuse this term. Ice age, then within this ice age, we have glacials and interglacials. So we are in an interglacial right now. If you go back about 20,000 years, that's the peak of the most recent glacial, when the continents were glaciated. But this ice age has been going on for over 2 million years. Now, it was set up by events even earlier. Uh, an ice cap started to develop on Antarctica about 20 million years ago when Antarctica moved to the South Pole. Uh, the Northern Hemisphere began to experience glaciation almost three million years ago. And uh, during this current ice age, the Quaternary Ice Age, the period of glacials and interglacials has been about 100,000 years. So every, every 100,000 years you go through a cycle, glacial, interglacial, and it's remarkably constant the cycle of glacials and interglacials. So here's the evidence going back, as you can see, about a little over 400,000 years. Now, we're looking here at the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. And what we find is that during the glacials, the CO2 concentration is low. It's a little over 180 <clears throat> parts per million. And during the interglacials, typically, and we're, so we're in an interglacial, the CO2 concentration has been about 280 parts per million. So go back and forth by about 100 parts per million. Now, right now, it's up to about 390 parts per million. So that's anthropogenic. That's because we've been burning fossil fuels and we've been cutting down trees. Fossil fuel burning and deforestation. But this is a pattern. Now, as best we can tell, this is not what's driving the cycle of glacials and interglacials. So I'll get to that in a second. However, this amplifies the cycle because the CO2 concentrations are high during the interglacials when it's warm anyway, and the CO2 concentrations are low during the glacials when it's obviously cold. Now, people puzzled about what was driving the cycle of glacials and interglacials for a long time. And a Serbian mathematician by the name of Milankovic apparently solved this problem back in the early 20th century. Now, Milankovic was brilliant, but he, he did have a rather high strangeness coefficient, as you can see from this quote. And he worked out all of these calculations by hand, which is remarkable, um, but he was as these folks characterize him, a bit of a maniac. It took him literally years with a pencil and paper, some of which was spent in prison for reasons that had nothing to do with his theories. He worked all this out uh, between, or at least the basics of the theory, from 1911 through 1917. And the explanation has to do with the vagaries of the Earth's orbit as it circulates, as it moves around the sun, and as it rotates on its axis. I'm going to go, there's, there's three components to this. I'm going to go through one of them in a little detail just to give you a sense of what's going on. Uh, here's the Earth, and this is the rotational axis of the Earth. So this would be the North Pole. This is the plane of rotation about the sun. So you notice that the rotational axis of the Earth is not vertical compared to the plane of rotation. It's tilted at an angle. And when it's summertime in the northern hemisphere, this axis is tilted towards the sun. The northern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun during summertime in the northern hemisphere. And that's why it's summer. 
when, at, when the Earth, so that we look at this right here, the axis is like this, and the northern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun. When you come over here about 180 days later, the northern hemisphere is tilted away from the sun, which is why you have winter in the northern hemisphere, and the southern hemisphere is tilted toward the sun. Now, the interesting thing about this behavior is that this rotational axis wobbles. And the analogy is to a top. So you can imagine the Earth being a top that's spinning around once every 24 hours. Spinning around very fast, but it's very slowly wobbling the way a top wobbles. And the time frame for this wobbling is about 22,000 years for a complete cycle. So in 11,000 years, <clears throat> The rotational axis of the Earth will be like this. And then, when it's summertime in the northern hemisphere, the Earth will be in this position right here. <clears throat> now, the point of this is that um, the orbit of the Earth around the Sun is elliptical. and when the Earth, when it's summertime in the northern hemisphere and the Earth is in this position here, the transit around the Sun is relatively short compared to the transit when the Earth is over here. You see, there's a long route around and a relatively short path here. So whether the rotational axis is like this and it's summertime in this position or the 11,000 years before or after when the rotational axis is like this. Here you have relatively short summers. Here you have long summers. Now, as I said, there are other components of this theory, but I'm just going to go into this to, to give you a flavor for what's going on. How do you get a glacial started? How do you get snow and ice accumulating on continents in the northern hemisphere? And the answer is you need cool summers or short summers because you will inevitably form snow and ice in the wintertime. The question is whether you melt it off in the summertime. And if you have a short summertime, then you have less opportunity to melt it off. So the situation over here, you see, gives you short summers in the northern hemisphere. And you can also imagine that, uh, as it turns out, this tilt angle is not constant. It varies between a maximum and a minimum. Right now, it's about halfway in between. The more the, the tilt, the greater the, the hotter the summer gets when it is summer the less the tilt angle, the cooler the summer. So this thing changes and so forth. It turns out, if you work through all the math, which Milankovitch did, you're looking at about a 100,000 year cycle. Uh, unfortunately, Milankovitch died before the confirmation of this theory came in, which was a result of coring in the bottom of the ocean. But when scientists uh, began doing that, they found the geological evidence that was very much consistent with this theory. All right, so we're in a glacial. We're in an interglacial period within, I'm sorry, we're in, a, we're in an ice age and we're in an interglacial within that time frame. Human beings first appeared about 150,000 years ago, so they've gone through one uh, glacial, interglacial cycle. Uh, they migrated out of Africa somewhere between 55,000 and 85,000 years ago. Uh, that's prior to the last glacial maximum. Started moving all over the Earth. The last major migration was the Polynesians out of Indonesia about 11,000 years ago. So in a geological time frame, this is very, very recent. And for most of this time, human beings were hunters and gatherers. They did not become farmers until about the last 10,000 years. Wheat and barley were domesticated about nine or 10,000 years ago. Uh, other crops in South America even more recently. 
And if you look at the history of human civilization, just going back a few thousand years, if you look at the Egyptians, for example, in biblical times, almost everybody was involved in farming. It's only very, very recently that you arrive at a situation where most of the food is produced by a small percentage of the people, and you have time to have people in armies and doing politics and TV shows and what like that that aren't you know, helping anybody, really. So the situation we're in right now is, the point I want to make is it's very unusual, not only in human history, but the history of the Earth. Now, it turns out that not very long ago, back between about 1550 and 1850, there was a period of time called the Little Ice Age. And it was a very noticeable event in human history that things really got colder. And so this is a plot of temperatures uh, right through the, the Little Ice Age up until recent times. And the point I want to make is look at the temperature tick marks here. You can see that, well, there's a lot of noise in the data. The temperature dropped by, at most, about one degree Celsius. One degree. And that produced very noticeable changes in the climate all over the Earth. So as an example, here's a very famous painting by a Dutch artist, 1608. It says, inspired by the harsh winter of 1608. And you can go back and see 1608 is smack in the middle of the Little Ice Age. Now, frankly, I don't think those people look very uncomfortable, but these people do. And unfortunately, George Washington decided to spend the winter at Valley Forge during the Little Ice Age, and his troops were very uncomfortable. So this was a cold time. There were very harsh winters during the Little Ice Age, and we're talking about a one degree change in temperature. Okay, so now here's the CO2 emissions going up into the atmosphere, and the, the red dots are the human population and you can see that these have been tracking one another almost perfectly uh, during the 20th century and beyond. Now, this is looking ahead, and this is a one-page paper in Nature. It's a very highly cited paper, and I just want to focus on these two parts of the graph right now. These are CO2 emissions, and we are right about here now, uh, the current Emissions are about nine gigatons of carbon per year. So you can see right about here. Now what these authors assumed is that we continue to burn fossil fuels until we burn them all up. And you can see the projected increase in fossil fuel emissions as uh, the population goes up and the fossil fuels are burned. And then about the year maybe 2150 or so, we start to run out of fossil fuels and the emissions start to decline. And you know, I think that alone should be a concern. I mean, we are going to run out of fossil fuels. They are not a renewable resource. Eventually we burn up all the fossil fuels and so finally we stop emitting CO2. Now this is the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere and we're at about 390 now. And as we burn these fossil fuels, based on understanding of atmospheric circulation and exchange of gases with the ocean and so forth, the concentration goes up to about 1,900 parts per million. So it's about five times higher than it is now. And the time frame here goes out to the year 3000. And you can see now the CO2 concentration is slowly coming down, but it's slow. And by the time you get to the year 3000, you're still looking at 1,500 parts per million. So that's why I'm saying this is going to be a very long-term process. It's going to take thousands, actually tens of thousands of years for all this to play out. Now eventually, the ocean is going to come to our rescue. But it's sluggish. Now, where is the CO2 ultimately going to go? 
Well, even now, only about half the CO2 that we're putting up to the atmosphere is actually staying there. About 25% is being taken up by the ocean, and another 25% is being taken up by plants uh, on the continents. Uh, interestingly, there's about 50 times more inorganic carbon in the ocean than there is in the atmosphere. So based on that, you might suspect that the vast majority of the inorganic carbon would go into the ocean. And it will eventually, but not in the short term. And the reason for that is that you only have this rather thin mixed layer at the surface of the ocean, maybe 50, 100 meters, that is effectively exchanging gases with the atmosphere. And the ocean is, as I said, about four kilometers deep. So this part of the ocean does pick up the CO2 from the atmosphere. The rest of the ocean is out of contact with the atmosphere, except for these few places, two places where you form deep and bottom water. Those are the places where you can inject CO2 into the deep ocean. But you have no way of doing it, or nobody's got a big stick stirring up the ocean. So the ocean will eventually take up the CO2, but it will be very, very slow. All right, so it's a North Atlantic, which we talked about in the Antarctic bottom water. Residence time in the bottom water is 500 to 1,000 years. Now, if we're willing to wait about 10,000 years, 90% of the CO2 that we're putting up into the atmosphere will be soaked up by the ocean. And if we're willing to wait even longer, other processes will kick in. What happens to the CO2 that the ocean picks up is reacts with water and it forms carbonic acid. And that is the process called ocean acidification. And it's a big concern to biologists because the plants and animals that live in the ocean are not accustomed to the ocean being a city. So this is the same figure again, but now we're going to concentrate on this. This is a change in the so-called pH of the seawater over time. And as the pH goes down, the acidity goes up. And I want you to focus particularly on this red region here. This is a period of roughly 500 years where the pH has decreased by about 0.7 units. And that is enough, based on current understanding, to eliminate a great many organisms that produce hard parts made out of calcium carbonate, which dissolves in acid. And I listed a few of them here. And you had a talk here uh, a few weeks ago about the impacts of all this on corals. Now, the point I want to make here is that, yeah, we could, we could go out and collect two lobsters and two shrimps and two oysters and put them in an ark. But it wouldn't be 40 days and 40 nights. It would be centuries, at least 500 years. So somehow, if these organisms are going to survive, they're going to have to get through a very long period of time during which the acidity of seawater is not going to be conducive with their survival. We will probably have to come to their rescue if we want them to survive. Now, when the CO2 finally gets down to the bottom of the ocean, good things happen. It reacts with sediments at the bottom of the ocean. Here's the CO2. Here's calcium carbonate and magnesium carbonate. These are components of sediments at the bottom of the ocean. When the reaction occurs, you release calcium, magnesium, and bicarbonate. These are all major salts in the sea. You're not adding anything that isn't already there. This is a perfectly natural process. It's how the ocean has dealt with the CO2 put up into the atmosphere by volcanoes, for example. So this will eventually come to the rescue. The problem is the time frame. It's very long, thousands of years, because you've got to get the CO2 all the way down to the bottom of the ocean. Now, the good news is there are plenty of sediments. Bad news, it takes a long time. OK, so what's going to happen in the interim? Things are going to heat up. That means you're going to speed up the hydrologic cycle. Evaporation will increase. Precipitation will increase. But it's not going to be uniform. And so what will happen is 
according to prognosticators, wet areas will get wetter and dry areas will get drier. That will have big implications for agriculture. The temperature will rise more at high latitudes. There are several reasons associated with it. One is CO2 is the primary greenhouse gas at high latitudes, and particularly in the Northern Hemisphere, because we're gonna melt all the ice on the Arctic Ocean. Uh, when that happens, the, the temperature will become warm enough that we will probably start melting the ice on Greenland, possibly West Antarctica, God forbid. Uh, this will cause a major rise in sea level. And then, of course, if things warm up sufficiently, the circulation of the ocean slows down or stops, the ocean becomes anoxic, and you have major extinctions of plant and animal life. So you can see that there's a lot of concerns. Also, the zone of the tropics will expand, so you have a variety of tropical diseases and vectors with potentially greater uh, environmental range. I want to touch briefly on the precipitation issue. Here's the equator, 60 degrees north, 60 degrees south. General pattern on the Earth is you have bands of high precipitation near the equator, and it's 60 degrees north and 60 south. In between, at about 30 degrees, you have your big desert areas. And that's because of the general features of atmospheric circulation. It's nothing to do with human activities. That's the pattern. Now, if you look at where the changes are going to occur, and this is from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the green is, is more precipitation, and you can see that that's near the equator and at about 60 degrees north and south. And in between, guess what? It gets drier. Now, there are exceptions to this associated with mountain ranges and whatnot, monsoonal circulation. But the general pattern is it's going to get drier at 30 degrees north and south. It's going to get wetter at the equator and 60 degrees north and south, which happen to be exactly the places where it's drier and wetter. So the, the wet areas in general will get wetter and the dry areas drier. In other words, you have more extreme climates, more flooding, you have more droughts. Uh, why will temperature rise more at high latitudes? Because CO2 is a dominant greenhouse gas at high latitudes. The ice on the Arctic is only a few meters thick, so as things warm up in the northern hemisphere, the Arctic Ocean will become ice-free. That will change the albedo or the reflectivity of the Earth at high latitudes in the northern hemisphere. So these are the projected temperature changes by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and if you look at the scale here, you're looking at an increase in temperature of five, six, seven, eight degrees at high latitudes in the Arctic. This is plenty, and that's the end of the century. I mean, that's not even looking beyond. So that's plenty of uh, increase in temperature to start thawing out the ice on Greenland. Now, the ice on Greenland is about 1,000 meters thick. So that's not going to melt off quickly. It will probably take... 500 to 1,000 years to melt all that ice. But once it happens, sea level will have risen by about seven meters, and that's not counting what's called thermal expansion of the ocean. You know, as the ocean warms up, it will expand. So you're adding at least seven meters to sea level. This will, is what will happen to the coastline of Florida with just six meters. Here's what happens to the coastline of Louisiana after one meter, and if you bring it up to six meters, the coastline is all the way up to Baton Rouge. New Orleans is long gone. So this increase in temperature at high latitudes in the northern hemisphere has huge implications for human beings on a time frame of 500 to 1,000 years. Anyone who lives near the coast, as you folks do here, uh, and then, of course, you have the possibility of thermal stratification of the ocean and the ocean becoming anoxic. Spread of tropical diseases. Cholera is a good example. Uh, when you come down with cholera, you basically dehydrate yourself to death. And the treatment, the simple treatment is what's called oral rehydration, i.e. drink water. In serious cases, they just hook you up to an IV and drip saline solution, 
into you to keep you from dehydrating yourself to death. Your immune system will kill the cholera if you don't dehydrate yourself to death first. And this is basically a tropical, subtropical disease. So the, the potential for this disease to cause problems will spread. Now, uh, here's some good news. We could do a lot to improve on energy efficiency. So here's a little chart that shows per energy, sorry, per capita energy consumption. You may think from what you read that the US is absolutely the worst. Nope. Our neighbor to the north, Canada, is worse than us. And you have some countries in the Middle East. If you think about it, I'm sure they have huge air conditioning issues. And they consume ungodly amounts of energy per capita. I haven't included all nations by any means on this list, but I want you to look at Germany down here. They have about half the per capita energy consumption that the United States has. And I've been to Germany recently, and they really don't look like they're suffering. So the fact is that we could be getting by, you know, without suffering, with a lot less energy than we're using. So what can you do to help? No, do not buy these things. Okay. Uh, here's a little graph that shows, here, first of all, this is the U.S. per capita energy consumption. See, at least it hasn't been going up. Here's Germany. It's the only major nation, in fact, it's the only nation that I could find where per capita energy consumption has actually been coming down. Now, part of this is due to the reunification of Germany and the elimination of inefficiencies in the former East Germany. But the fact is the Germans have a very aggressive ongoing program to cut energy use. And a lot of things that they're doing are not costing them a dime. Now, they may cost a little money up front, but in the long term, they save money. Now, the big joker in the deck here is China. And you can see their per capita energy consumption is nowhere near what it is in the US. But they'd probably like it to be. And they're starting to come up. Now. We've got alternatives to fossil fuels right off the shelf. And I want to go through three of these, solar, wind, and geothermal. There's, there's nothing stopping us, folks. We could do this. These are the solar resources. It's basically just looking at the amount of incoming solar radiation. And you can see the primary resources in the southwestern part of the country. No, it's not over here. Hardly surprising. But there's a huge resource here. At 10% efficiency, meaning you're taking, you're just converting 10% of the incoming solar radiation into electricity, you could provide all the electricity that the US needs by harvesting the incoming solar radiation on a square, 83 miles on a side, pick your spot somewhere in the southwest. Now, where did this 10% come from? That's just a number. It's actually very conservative. We can do a lot better than that. But this turns out to be impractical. Why? Here are photovoltaic devices that are capturing solar radiation and converting it into electricity. And these things are up to 40% efficient. The problem here is that they're expensive. And the ones that actually do it with 40% efficiency involve rare earth elements that are, frankly, we would run out of. We would literally run out of if we try to cover a square 83 miles on a side. They, they, they don't exist. And interestingly, the major source of some of these is China, which is probably not going to give them away. So we can do this on a small scale, but it's not the solution. So what is the solution? Solar thermal, where you're actually converting the sunlight into heat, which is something you can store. And so this is a very simple example. I'm sure you've heard of these. You can use you know, solar hot water heater kind of thing. But here's a facility uh, in the southwestern US where they're using mirrors to reflect sunlight onto this tower. And in the tower is molten salt. Not molten salt, molten salt. 
So they heat up the salt. It gets very hot. This turns out, it's not my area, but as I understand, it's a very efficient way to store energy in molten salt. So they have this whole array of mirrors, nothing expensive. I mean, the mirrors do track the sun, so they're programmed to do that. They focus the sunlight on this tower, heat up the salt to some ungodly temperature, and that's the way you store the energy. And you can get 15 or 20 percent efficiency doing this. All right, now let's look at wind power. And believe it or not, the United States is number one. This is the European Union. It's all the, the nations in the European Union. Right now, the United States is number one nation in the world in terms of generation of electricity by wind. Now, we see we recently passed Germany. It used to be in first place. Uh, I want you to notice Spain, Denmark, and Portugal. Now, Spain is right up here. Portugal and Denmark, I only included them for another reason. They're down here. They don't look that impressive. But if you look at the percentage of the electricity that these countries are generating by wind, look at Denmark, it's 19%. Portugal is 11%, Spain is 11%. The US doesn't look so good here. Even though the US is number one in megawatts, it's still, because it's a big energy consumer, it's only producing a little over 1% of its energy uh, by the wind. Germany is 6.6%. However, it turns out that we have a lot of untapped resources, as you folks probably know, because you've got some right offshore. Uh, the big resources on the continent are right smack down the middle, and Texas right now is our big uh, producer of electricity by wind. But there's a scale here, and you, you may not read it, but red here says outstanding. So there you are. The resource offshore is outstanding. You just need to tap into it. And here's the amount of uh, wind power that's actually being generated. If Texas were a country, it would rank number six globally in terms of electricity generated by the wind. And you can see there's other states here. They're, again, they're in that band right down the middle of the country. Uh, and there's a huge resource offshore here that obviously hasn't been tapped into yet. Uh, this is a, one of the wind farms in Texas, and these blades are huge. I've seen them being hauled down the road by 18 wheelers. Uh, Europe right now accounts for about 55% of installed wind power. The US and Europe together, 81%. So other nations in the world, not really, you know, like China, they're putting in the installations, but they're lagging behind. Anticipated growth is 21% per year. So this is uh, a resource that people have recognized and are starting to tap into it, and it's growing very rapidly. As I said, Texas is the number one in the U.S. and be six in the world if it were a country. Uh, U.S. wind power grew by 32% between 2007 and 2008, so it's really ramping up. And here's an interesting statistic. Wind farms in Texas, Kansas, and North Dakota could provide electricity sufficient for the entire United States. Uh, and there's nothing stopping us. Offshore wind farms could do the same. Okay, finally, I want to look at geothermal. Now, there's various facets of this. Basically, you're tapping into hot water below the surface of the Earth that's being heated by geothermal means. Uh, one scenario is that you just have steam coming up and you use it to run a turbine, to uh, run a generator to produce electricity. If you don't mind living in an earthquake zone or on top of a volcano, hey, you're all set. So uh, this is a so-called dry steam generator. There frankly aren't very many places where you encounter this situation, but there is one here in California. Geysers put into service in 1962. It's still the largest producing geothermal field in the world. So they're just tapping into very hot steam that's being produced as it comes in contact with hot rock underground. Another scenario that you may be aware of uh, is just pumping hot water through buildings for heating, and you can actually use it for cooling as well. 
So you bring the hot, it doesn't have to be steam now, so you can just be hot water from underground, run it through a heat exchanger, and this is your working fluid then, and you run it to buildings and heat and cool the buildings. Uh, this is functional right now with conventional power plants uh, that are engineered to use their, the hot wastewater that they use for the same purpose. And if you, I just threw this in, I thought this is so weird, you know, why do you want to grow alligators in Idaho? I don't know. But if you want to, you could use geothermally heated water to do it, and here's your happy alligators with the snow-capped mountain in the background. Uh, the third scenario, which works absolutely everywhere, is these heat pumps. And basically, you're just using the heat capacity of the earth in the wintertime. Uh, the earth below the surface is warmer than your house. In the summertime, it's cooler. And so you just run a heat exchanger in a working fluid underground. Uh, during the summertime, you, you dump heat to the ground. In the wintertime, you extract heat from the ground. Anybody can put these in place. You know, there's various scenarios. Benefits can be used almost anywhere. They're energy and cost efficient, conserve fly. It's a no-brainer. And where can you do, where can you put in these heat pumps? Anywhere. Anywhere in the United States. Now, if you want to, you know, if you want to do some of the other scenarios, you're somewhat limited because you need hot water near the surface or steam, which is mainly the western part of the country. But these heat pumps can go into place anywhere. Now, I, I just wanted to touch a bit on the human health issues because we, we have this concern that some of these very nasty tropical diseases like cholera, yellow fever, dengue fever, and so forth, the zone with, which, within which these organisms can propagate will expand. And uh, here's a victim of uh, cholera in Haiti. I'm sure you're familiar with that situation. Now, the point I want to make here is that it doesn't have to get any worse because you can prevent these things from happening or you can be effective in treating the victims. Here's the problem with respect to cholera, bad water. So Rita Caldwell, who used to be the director of the National Science Foundation, said at a meeting that I attended a few years ago, you could save more lives world globally. You could save more lives by providing people with safe drinking water than you could save by vaccinating every person on the planet. And she's right. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of little children particularly, die from diarrhea, from drinking contaminated water. Here's the way you get your water in Bangladesh. And this is what it looks like during a monsoon. So here's a woman collecting drinking water. And someone held up their hand and said, well, why don't you just boil the water? And Rita Caldwell's response was, during the monsoon season, boiling water is not an option. And so this is the way you get it. And so what Rita Caldwell and her colleagues did was they trained these women to collect the water, putting uh, several layers of this cloth over the mouth of the jug to filter the water. And this is called seri cloth. I think she's wearing seri cloth. I mean, it's, seri cloth is all over the place in countries like Bangladesh. You don't have to go out of your way to get it. And what they find is if these women collect this water and filter it through the seri cloth, you cut the incidence of cholera in half. It doesn't cost a thing. And you don't have to train every woman to do this because they talk to their friends when they see the result. Now I want to get into, uh, just briefly, into uh, pure you know, health care. So this is a fellow that was brought into a clinic also in Haiti obviously has one foot in a grave. Um, he was brought into a clinic operated by a group called Partners in Health. And uh, these folks know what to do when they see a sick person. So they ran some tests. He's infected with HIV. His immune system is shot. And he's dying of tuberculosis. They start him on therapies. And six months later, the same guy. So that's the difference between no health care and health care. So uh, even if some of these problems expand, if you have the health care in place, you can, do, you can go a long way to dealing with them. 
Okay, to summarize things, uh, fossil fuel burning will very likely continue for several hundred years until all the fossil fuels are exhausted. Well, that's my opinion. I, I don't see any reason to doubt that. Impacts on climate will last for actually tens of thousands of years. Mitigation is technically possible. We don't need to discover something we don't already know how to do. So the big issue is where there's some motivation. The sooner the better. And I'm afraid that to a fair degree we are going to learn how to, or have to learn how to adapt even if climate doesn't change because of human activities, it will change for perfectly natural reasons uh, given time. And if human beings expect to inhabit this planet over an extended period of time, they will have to learn how to adapt. And I think this is a plug for the next, um, the next talk, right, in two weeks. So Chris Reddy is going to be talking about lessons learned from an environmental crisis, communicating science. That's, um, is that just a week from now? One week, okay, so see you in one week. <laughs> All right, are we enter we're entertaining questions now? Yeah, we have time for a, a few questions. It's getting late, everybody. So if you have a question, you uh, uh, raise your hand. Right? The microphone will come over and you can ask a question. Hi, um, quick question. I thought that CO2 and temperature were strongly correlated. Is that only the case in the last 420,000 years? You showed a slide of ancient history that seemed to indicate that CO2 and temperature were kind of totally independent of each other. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, you got to remember that the energy output from the sun has been changing right along with everything else. And so as time has gone, it's so conveniently, as the CO2 has been going down, the energy output from the sun has been coming up. And so the, the folks who run these models uh, say that through a, a fortuitous combination of circumstances, the temperature on the Earth has been remarkably constant going all the way back to probably the Archean. And there's a big debate about what were the greenhouse gases uh, during Archean because there wasn't any CO2 in the atmosphere then. See, CO2 is an oxidized form of carbon, and there was no oxygen in the atmosphere. So it had to be things like ammonia or methane, other greenhouse gases that were providing the uh, greenhouse effect then because the sun certainly wasn't putting out anywhere near as much energy. And as you get up into the Phanerozoic, you, you see there were some fluctuations in temperature by about 10 degrees, so it's, it's not a perfect system. But in general, during that period of, of you know, almost 500 million years, the, the CO2 has been going down and the solar radiation has been going up. And they, to, to a fair degree, they have conveniently balanced one another. Well, I think we'll hold the questions for a short time because it's getting uh, late. And I want to remind everybody about our lecture next week, Chris Reddy. The environmental uh, uh, disaster he's res responding to, or crisis, was the uh, Gulf oil spill. Professor Reddy is an ex expert on oil spills. So let's thank our speaker.